Hey booktube, Chelsea's Reads here. I'm gonna keep trying to move my head weird ways so my glasses don't have um, the reflection on it. I'm way past due for a new pair, but of course with uh, the lockdown I can't get a new pair. And when I do, I'm not gonna have these stupid reflective lenses because look how stupid that is. Like, I hate them. Do not recommend. I am, in fact, wearing a Christmas shirt because Santa Claus makes me happy. Um, yeah, this was um, another weird week for me. I apologize for, like, the spazzy intro here, um, but this is, like, the first day I've really felt, like, okay this week, like, today, like, this was, like, mental breakdown week, not gonna lie. Um, my thesis is due in two weeks, like, my thesis for my master's, um, and I still have two chapters to write for it, and, uh, no motivation to do it. Um, every other day I feel like work is emailing me and changing stuff. I am a teacher, so we have switched to this online learning. I teach special needs kids in a center-based school. Um, so online learning is especially difficult because my kids don't really do academics, and especially since I teach adults with special needs. Um, and then, uh, I have a family member that's in the hospital. Um, we did get news that he will be discharged, though, uh, by Friday uh, if everything continues to be clear. It was not the virus, um, that put him in there. But, you know, I'm trying to keep some faith. I read, um... I did a decent amount of reading this week. Um, I actually marathoned two books or like set a marathon pace for myself because my goal is to some someday do a 24 hour marathon. So I just did um, try to pace myself um, with one book and see if I could meet timelines to finish them. And I did. So we'll get into that a little bit. Um, and let's do it. We actually have a book haul this week too. So let's start with that. So the first book that came in this week is The Unhoneymooners Unhone by Christina Lauren. Um, this is a book that uh, my book club picked for this month. So um, I'm, I have, you know, five days to finish it, but that's not going to happen. Um, I'm probably not going to end up reading it for this month because it did come so late. Um, it is a lover, our friend, enemies to lovers story about um two enemies end up going to Hawaii I believe um and then of course mistaken identity they have to pretend to be a married couple kind of a, a deal so it kind of sounds like um the Adam Sandler movie blended a little bit to me um but it's supposed to be fun uh and funny uh it's actually a lot thicker than I um thought it was gonna be um but I might hold off reading this um because I've finally hit a stride on reading books that have been on my TBR for like years and my book club, we originally were like, okay, let's go ahead and we'll talk about these books digitally. And the last book we talked about for March was The Medical Patient, or The Medical Patient, I keep calling it, that's The Silent Patient, but we never actually talked about it, so I'm hoping that's the case for this one, and I'll have a little bit extra time to get to it, because I really, um, just am not ready to read this one yet. But I do hear it's a lot of fun, it's been getting really good reviews, so I will eventually read it, just, um, not quite yet. So the second book that came in this week is actually a book that I already own, but um, as you've heard me say like a million times already, um, books are in storage, um, and this is um, Mrs. Mike by Benedict and Nancy Friedman, um, and this was one of my favorite books. I read it back in middle school for the first time. I think I read it again in high school, and I don't think I've read it since then. So it's been about 10 years since I've last read this, um, but... I just, I keep saying it's my favorite book when people ask me, like, what's your go-to favorite? Um, so I'm a little bit nervous to reread this, but I was in the mood just to see if it still held up to the same standards. It's a very fluffy romance about a Canadian Mountie man and, um, yeah, and then a girl from Boston. And Mike is the Mountie and he meets, oh god, what was her name? Catherine Mary O'Fallon. And she's just very sweet uh, and super nice. And then they go to the Canadian wilderness together and forge a life. Um, and she has to adjust to the different style of life that Mike offers her. Um, and like I said, it was just very fluffy. I know at one point they like adopt, I think, a Native American girl, if I'm remembering correctly. It's, like I said, it's been 10 years since I've read it. Um, and I just remember really, really liking it. Um, it's a very simple love story, you know, um, adult scenes, more of like a PG-13 kind of a love story, maybe even just a PG love story if I'm recalling correctly. 
Um, so I am actually really looking forward to rereading this. Um, I don't know when I'm going to reread it because like I said, now that I've hit the stride of like reading books that have been dormant on my shelf for so long, I don't really want to break that stride. Um, I'm sure because like I said, I was compelled to buy another copy. Um, this one was only 75 cents. Um, that, um, yeah, it's probably going to pop up quicker on my TBR than on Honeymooners, um, unfortunately. So we'll see. Um, and that was it for books that came in this week. I think I only have a couple ordered. Um, I, like, I, I've got to stop by books, guys. I know I've one pre-ordered, and that's not supposed to come for another, uh, two weeks, I think, is the release date. So that'll be here probably mid-May with, after it ships, after the release date, or whatever, because it, Amazon doesn't ship it until the release date, so you don't receive it on release day. It ships on release day. So we'll see about that one, um, and let's dive into what I read this week. So the first book that I read this week was The Great Glowing Coils of the Universe. Uh, it is by Je Joseph Fink and Jeffy Jeffrey Craner. It is the season two scripts from the Welcome to Night Vale podcast. Um, so Welcome to Night Vale is one of the most popular podcasts out there. It is a fictionalized um, story about a town, so Cecil Palmer, or, yes, he's, because Cecil Baldwin, I think, is the actor, and he's playing Cecil Palmer, I believe, or I might have gotten the names flipped, whatever, Cecil is the narrator, um, he is a radio host, and he is reporting on the fictional town of Night Vale. Now, Night Vale's not, like, your normal city, like, in this season two, like, he looks out the window and he goes, oh, look, a subway a subway system just, like, popped up out of the ground. Um, and the head of the PTA is the, the glow cloud, all hail. Um, and it rains the corpses of dead cats and dogs. Um, this also is a very touching story about Megan, who was a little girl that was born inside a grown man's hand, and that was it. Um, she's a detached grown man's hand. This... Uh, volume primarily follows the arc of Strux Corp, which is an evil corporation that started in the neighboring town of Desert Bluff. Um, this also ties up the former intern Dana plot and the mayoral race arcs, um, in which the faceless little woman who lives near house takes on Hiram McDonald's, who's literally a five-headed dragon. Uh, John Peters, you know, the farmer, is in this a lot. Um, Cecil and Carlos take their relationship to the next level. They're officially boyfriend and boyfriend in this book, and that was adorable. Um, we see P Mayor, former Mayor Pamela Winchell lose her mind in this one, and, um, Lot 37 has been bought. Um, these are, like I said, they're the scripts, and the thing is, each episode, each script, um, is a different story. Some of them are related through, like, you know, you'll see Dana pop up, and Dana's actually in an alternate reality, um, at the start of this one, because uh, she went into the dog park, and so we get, like, her popping in every now and then. Um, oh yeah, we see Tamika Flynn is introduced in this one. Before every episode, they have a little commentary by either one of the writers, the guest writers, or one of the voice talents. And I thought that was very interesting. The story of how Megan came into creation is actually really heartbreaking. Um, not really heartbreaking, it's very touching, I guess. Um, this is when the series, like, when the series started be taking itself a little bit more seriously, and these arcs are becoming darker and more horror-esque. Um, still a lot of sci-fi, because Carlos is a scientist, and it's actually... Very sad where this arc leaves off with Carlos being in that alternate dimension and not knowing if he's going to be able to come back because he doesn't technically belong in Night Vale. Um, so well, most of the stories are unconnected. There's usually a thread. It's all the same characters that they're reporting on. Um, it doesn't quite have the same impact um, reading it as, you know, if hearing Cecil's narration because uh, he really, really brings the story to life. So I don't know if I'd recommend this for people who haven't listened to the uh, podcast before. Um, at least listen to the first couple episodes before you pick up the books, uh, the scripts anyway, because, um, I mean, they're still, they're, the stories are good. They're good enough to hold up on their own. I enjoyed reading this and revisiting these old stories. Uh, because we're so far into the podcast at this point. Um, I think this book ends... 
Let, let me check. Well, it has two of the live show, the scripts for the live shows at the end. Um, but it ends with episode... Episode 49. So this is still pretty early on in the show's conception, because I'm pretty sure there are over 200 episodes at this time. And there's only four volumes of scripts so far. But I definitely recommend this for fans of the podcast, or if you haven't picked up, or even listened to the podcast in a long time, then definitely look through these. Um, it didn't take me too long to read it a couple days, I guess. Um, apparently a bit longer, because uh, it's a lot later in the week now. I guess, you know, I don't realize how long it does take me to read these until, like, you know, it's it's Wednesday, and I'm like, oh my god, I've only read one book so far this week. Um, but I definitely do recommend this. I gave it four stars. The next book that I read was The Man in the Black Suit by Sylvain Reynard. Now, this is the book that kind of tripped me up and slowed me down this week reading. Um, and then I ended up marathoning it because um, it's not too long, but it did take me a minute to get into it. It's about a hotel concierge. Her name is Acacia, or that's how I pronounced her name. And um, she meets this mysterious guest. He has a scar going down his cheek. And he makes, like, really odd demands of her. And she actually thinks that he is an art thief um, based on something she sees in his room. So she calls the Paris police, who are actually looking for a couple of paintings, including the Maltese she thinks she sees in this gentleman's room. Um, so what ends up happening is we find out that her manager is racist, even though it's in Paris. And I guess I didn't realize Paris was racist against Brazilians. I guess racism's all around the world, though, so why should I be surprised <laughs> that it's... I don't know. I guess it was just a shock to hear, like, like why would f French people hate Brazilians? But they did. Um, so they're looking for an excuse to fire her, so this man reveals that um, Pierre Brockman was actually just an alias. His real name is Nick Castier, and Nick Castier is actually not an art thief. He's on the hunt for art thieves, and he's trying to recover stolen art um, because his sister was murdered um, in their gallery. So now Acacia is on this wild ride around the world with Nick Castier to uncover this art. Um, I've read the Gabriel series and the Florentine series by Sylvain Reynard and I don't know why I enjoy these books as much as I do because they're so I guess problematic um, in the fact that they're ridiculous. Um, and this one, if you find out that Acacia is not actually Brazilian, she's actually Muslim. Um, and her father finds her while he's in Dubai and decides he's going to kill her and her mother because they um, are not following the Quran. So he's just going to kill them because they're a disgrace. Um, so he's a terrorist and an arms dealer. And then there's also the Russian mob that kidnaps Nicholas, uh, Nicholas and decides he's going to kill them because he's the one who stole the artwork, because that's what he does. Um, so it's ridiculous, but it is also a love story. Obviously, like, Acacia and Nicholas are, um... <laughs> I don't know why, I, like, the entire time I read it, it was, like, sometimes it's Nicholas, but most of the time I was reading as Nicholas, uh, because he's French, and, like, I had to read it with a stupid accent that's probably completely incorrect. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it is their love story. Um, their love story kind of happened quickly, but the sex scenes were good. Um it was just very sudden because they were both living under these aliases and hiding like very important information about each other from each other and then it was odd but I have enjoyed all of his work as problematic as they may be um so I ended up giving this one four stars just because um I don't know it was fun and silly but I have enjoyed all of his work despite all of that so Go in with low expectations if you want to pick it up. It was it was not that hard to read. It was just hard to get into, I guess. Um, but I did make myself finish it within 12 hours, and I did. Um, so if I can do it, you can do it too. I did read one ebook this week, and that was Until Friday Night by Abby Gaines. And of course, like I don't know how to show ebooks on here, so like we're just gonna we're gonna play with that. Yeah, Until Friday Night by Abby. Abby Glines, sorry, and um, I really thought I was going to hate it because I don't read too much contemporary YA, it's just not my thing, um, but I was like, you know what, I'm, I really have been in the mood for contemporary lately, I don't know why, um, but contemporary YA to me is like the worst, and I knew it was like contemporary romantic YA, and I was like, oh my god, this is going to be awful, but I ended up loving it. 
Um, so the story is Maggie watched her father kill her mother in cold blood, like shoot her in the face. So ever since that day, Maggie has not spoken a word by choice until she meets West Ashby. West Ashby is a linebacker, I believe. He's either a linebacker or a wide receiver. I got it mixed up. Um, for his football team. And his dad is dying of cancer, and he decides not to tell anybody. So at the field party, which is after Friday night, after their big football game, he sees Maggie all alone. Her brother, or her cousin, her cousin Brody is the quarterback of the football team, so her aunt makes him take her to this field party after the game, but she doesn't talk to anybody, so she just kind of stays off to the side. West finds her. Um, is very upset by his dad, so just kind of unloads on her and ends up kissing her, and then Maggie speaks to him for the first time, and then he becomes the only person Maggie talks to, and they both kind of use it as a way to grieve and get over their losses. Um, the thing that I like about this one was everything that I would like thought I would have a problem with was addressed. Um, first of all, they do kind of forge this bond over grief and over healing but Maggie says that straight up when she actually breaks up with West because she said um I don't think you love me I think you love the idea of me or I think you love what I offer you I'm just a crutch at this point I need to know that you love me and not just um as a way to get over your father your father's death and your father's illness so I really appreciated that um show of communication and I thought it was nice of her to address that Second of all, I know I've talked a lot about um, sex and YA and my complicated thoughts on it. I kind of briefly brushed on. I really like how this was handled um, because West and Maggie do have sex in this. However, um, we see Maggie's thought process and her thought process was like, do I want this? Am I ready for this? And then she stopped and she said, is he doing this out of love or is he doing this because he doesn't want to feel? And the fact that she addressed it, the fact that Wes stopped and asked for her consent, asked about her comfort, I just thought this was a perfect way to portray it. Um, it was portrayed as this is something I want to do because I'm in love with him and I want to give this to him. Not, I don't want him to take it from me. Like, I don't want him to take it from me. I want to give him this and I want to have this experience together. And I just thought that was a perfect way to have sex in YA. <laughs> Because, it again, it shows that thought process. It, she didn't just throw herself. She wasn't overcome with passion at, you know, 16. She did think about it rationally. And I just thought it was a very beautiful scene. And I ended up giving this book five stars. <laughs> this is only the second book I've given five stars to this year. Um, I did rent this from Libby, and I loved it so much that I think I'm going to end up buying a physical copy of it so I can read it again someday. The next book that I read this week was actually the second book that I marathoned, and that was Meddling Kids by Edgar Quintero. As you can see from the cover, this is a spoof of um, Scooby-Doo. Um, it's kind of like how I've been describing it, is if you take the kids from Scooby-Doo, age them 13 years, plop them into It Chapter 2, and, you know, throw in the evil, the evil dead, and you have meddling kids. As you can see, all the cool, like, symbols on the back, the very neat black lighting kind of sort of cover. Um, this book, um, I don't know if I'm able to put into words, like, about it. Like, it felt like, it felt like a sequel, which kind of makes sense because it's based off of Scooby-Doo. Kind of. I mean, there's a dog, even. this In this book, the dog's name is Tim. Um, so in this book, the mystery gang actually calls themselves, like, the Detective Club or something. The Blighton Summer Detective Club. And th when they were teenagers, they uncovered um, the lake monster of Blighton Hills. And then that was actually just a man in a mask. However, now that they are adults, it's 13 years later since then. One of them has committed suicide. Um, and they are, they are convinced that they didn't catch the right man, that there's still something on because they saw stuff and stuff happened there. So they decide to go back to the house and investigate. Um, two of the girls apparently used to have feelings for each other as kids, but they never addressed it until they were, now that they're adults. One of the kids, when he was an adult, checked himself in a mental hospital and they had to break him out. Um, and that was it. 
the thing that bothered me, I think, the most about this is because it read like it was a sequel. Like, at one point, the the character Andy, who is our um, Daphne, I guess, character, she literally was like, well, you remember what we saw. And then the characters, like, shared this look. And I was like, but we don't know what you guys saw. Like, what are you talking about? Um... And I guess they couldn't really do a book about what happened because it would be, like, Scooby-Doo fan fiction. But I don't know. I think if there was a first book where it hinted at these supernatural elements, it would make more sense. Because in this one, when all of a sudden um, Nate was like, oh, I have the Necronomicon, which I only know from the Evil Dead is, like, you know, a book to raise the dead. But I was like, where is this coming from? And then there was, like, these things about ghosts being real and there was actual creatures um, I was really confused with this whole thing. I didn't like the, well, remember when we were kids? Like, but no, we don't. Like, and, like, just saying, like, oh, Peter's dead, and they were all sad. And, like, Peter was the Fred-like character in this. But, like, wouldn't it be more impactful if you, like, started this book by revealing Fred that, um, Fred, in the book he's Peter, that Peter, um, committed suicide? I think it'd be more impactful if we saw Peter when he was a kid, or when he was a teenager, and we could, like, it would hit us better, and we'd understand why the characters are reacting the way they are. At the, like, they already have pre-established relationships, but we don't understand it, because we never actually see it. We're just told, this is how, this is how the, they are. But why? You know what I mean? Like, I don't get the unresolved sexual tension between the two girls, because we didn't see it. We were just told that, like, oh yeah, I used to like you, and I thought it was obvious. Like, I think that was the frustrating part. Um... And like I said, it just felt like an It Chapter 2, like, ripoff, just with the Scooby-Doo kids in it, and I, I don't know, I gave us three and a half stars, and I think that's being generous. I think it's only really a three star, maybe even a two and a half, um, because now the more I think about it, the more, like, irritated I am with it, because it could have been so good if I had gotten that connection with the characters. Instead, you gave me characters that had these pre-established relationships from an event that they saw specific things that led them to want to go back, but we've never seen it, and we don't know what it is. Um, so, I don't know. A lot of people like this book, though. I was not one of them. Maybe you'll have a better, a better go with it. And the last book that I read this week, I actually listened to audiobook, and it was Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. This is the Jim Dale version, in my opinion, the superior version. <laughs> so I have reread Harry Potter more times than I can count, um, and it never gets old. I was reading it with my cousin, uh, who's reading it for the thir first time. She's 13 years old, and she was just as moved as it as I was. Um, Rereading this book, even knowing what happens, who passes away, who survives, um, and the closure to all these character arcs and the growth that we see... This still really hit me, and I think this book gets a bad rap. Like, a lot of people don't like the seventh book, and now that I've reread it, like, I don't understand it, because it was just so good. And I think the issue was, like, when you read it for the first time, you have expectations, and a book series of this, like, caliber is never going to meet your expectations. But now going in with no expectations, knowing what happened, it really hit differently. It was very emotional, and I really felt that. Like, I really... It really hit me, and I really think this is actually one of the best books in the series. Um, this whole reread of Harry Potter was very emotional, especially at this time when we're all kind of stuck inside and trying to keep the hope. Um, this book definitely restored that faith, especially when Neville said, um, you know, they needed a leader because when they see somebody step up, it gives them hope. And that was like, it was just a really good message, and I really enjoyed it. And that was it for this week. Um, I seem to always get in the 25-minute range. I've been trying to cut that down. Obviously, it didn't work very well this week. Um, so on the docket for this week, right now, I just started a nonfiction book about Harry Potter. Uh, I have one more ebook, which is a YA book. It's the last book in the Bard Academy series. It's been years since I've read that book. I also have a Star Wars book on the docket and a Women's Murder Club mystery and... Um, one of the Dorothy Must Die books. And that's it. <laughs> uh, also, coming up in the next couple of days, I should be posting my very first bookshelf tour. And I have at least two bookshelf tours that I'm planning. So be on the lookout for that soon. Um, other than that, have a very safe and very healthy week, guys. I'll see you next time.